Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And recently in EC3400 Analog Electronics, we've been looking at op amps that have non-ideal frequency responses. In a previous lecture, we looked at what effect this has on the non-inverting amplifier configuration. And in this lecture, we'll check out the effect it has on the inverting amplifier configuration. To review, we're using A to represent the open loop gain of our operational amplifier. We're representing everything in the Laplace domain. So you can imagine substituting in J omega for S to get the frequency response A. And we're using capital letters to represent signals in the Laplace domain and lowercase letters to represent signals in the time domain. Now, A could be something pretty complicated, but we usually model A as just a first-order low-pass filter with DC value A0 and corner frequency omega naught. Now, Marshall Leach usually writes these kinds of transfer functions like this in his notes. I often like to multiply the numerator and the denominator to write it in this equivalent fashion, but you can use whatever form you want. And remember, we defined something called the gain bandwidth product, which was A0 times omega naught. Now, this particular gain bandwidth product has everything represented in terms of radians per second. You could divide everything here by 2 pi to write everything in terms of hertz. So we usually represent those kind of quantities using the letter F. So if we were to divide both sides of the expression here by omega naught, we could write this kind of expression here. And remember, Bode plots basically involve ratios. So on a Bode plot, a ratio of gain corresponds to a ratio of frequencies. So if we think about how the ratios here work, then we realize that we have a negative going slope over here. And if you were to plug in the gain bandwidth product for omega, you wind up with unity gain. And in a previous lecture, we saw that the non-inverting amplifier configuration actually gave you this full gain bandwidth product. But we'll see that for the inverting configuration, we don't get all of that. So let's take a look at that inverting configuration. So the positive input is grounded. So we don't have this term here. We just have minus AS V minus S. All right. So what I need to do is I need to write VO equals minus AS times V minus, and I need to express that V minus in terms of VI and VO. So I'm going to use a superposition argument and say that the contribution to V minus from VI is going to be a voltage divider. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine grounding the VO side so I have this voltage divider with RF in the numerator, and then I have R1 plus RF in the denominator. And similarly, I'll say that there's a contribution from VO. So when I look at that contribution, I ground out VI. And when I calculate that contribution, I ground VI over here. So now I have a voltage divider with R1 in the numerator. Now, this may seem a little strange at first because I'm including a contribution from VO when VO is the thing that I'm finding. But if we remember Marshall Leach's approach to superposition with dependent sources, this is okay to do as long as I don't actually try to solve for VO until I've included all the contributions. The mistake people usually make is that they'll say not include this term here and they'll look at this and say, oh, well, VO must equal zero you have to have all the contributions before you solve for the controlling variables. Okay, so let me take this term here and move it over to the left-hand side. And I have to make sure to remember to multiply by A, S along the way. And let's see, when I do that, the minus turns into a plus. And then let's see, I'll take both sides of the expression here and divide them by this one plus all the stuff and I'll take both sides of the expression and divide by VI. So I can say VO over VI equals all of this stuff here. So I wind up with this expression here, and I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by R1 plus RF to clear the fraction. So I wind up with an R1 plus RF in this spot where the one is. So that looks a little something like this. And let's see, let's divide the numerator and the denominator by R1. So we'll write the expression like this. Let's see, I have the R1 here. 
And when I divide this R1 by R1, I get 1. And when I divide this RF by R1, I get this RF over R1. And then the R1 goes away in this term. I know all of this algebra is really tedious, but by going through it in this level of detail, I'm hoping that you can find any errors that I make. All right, so let's divide both the numerator and the denominator by AS. So I'll have this 1 plus RF over R1 now divided by AS. The AS here winds up going away, and the AS here winds up going away. All right, so on the next slide, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to swap the order of the terms here. So I'm going to write 1 plus all of this stuff, and then I'm going to substitute in the actual first order model for A. So doing that swap and making that substitution, I wind up with this. So this is that 1 over A, S. All right, let me define a factor K and that's going to be R1 over R1 plus RF. Now this factor K corresponds to a voltage divider that indicates how much of the output is getting fed back to the negative terminal here. So if you imagine grounding VI, this would indicate that portion. So the reciprocal of K is R1 plus RF over R1, which I could rewrite as 1 plus RF over R1, and look, that's this factor here. So I could rewrite our gain formula here and substitute in k in this spot. So let me take this expression here and split it into a term that contains s and a term that doesn't contain s. So this is just a constant here with respect to s. And now I'm going to do something that is going to look a little weird. I'm going to take this expression and factor it out of the denominator. So I can wind up with the expression sitting here in front. And then when I factor it out of this spot here, I wind up with a 1. So if I take this here and multiply it by 1, I get that there. All right, and then in order to get this term here, which you see right here, I'm basically going to write 1 over what this mess is. So I have this 1 plus 1 over k a naught down here. So when I multiply this through, these wind up canceling out, and I wind up with this term left. So that was a bit complicated, but just stare at it, and you'll see that it works. The question isn't so much what I did as why I did it. First, notice that I can take this k a naught and multiply it through. So I'll wind up with a k a naught here, and then the k a naughts will wind up canceling, and I'll wind up with a 1 in this spot. So performing that operation, I wind up with something that looks like this. And now this is in our usual form for a first-order low-pass filter. Here I have a time constant. So I have 1 over 1 plus s over a time constant. And then here, I have the value of the DC gain. So let me create some variables. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define the magnitude of the DC gain as this expression here. Now we need to remember that the configuration is inverting, so I have to remember to put the minus sign there. The reason I'm doing this here is it lets me sort of compare the results we're getting with the non-inverting configuration without having to have a bunch of magnitude signs all over the place. Okay, now let me play a game where I'm going to substitute in the expression for k in the numerator, but not in the denominator. When I do that, I wind up with this r1 over r1 plus rf here, that's k. And notice that the r1s wind up canceling. So I'm left with a0 times rf over r1 plus rf all over k a naught plus 1. And then the time constant associated with the pole in this feedback configuration is omega naught, our original open loop cutoff frequency, times k a naught plus 1. So like with the non-inverting configuration, essentially what we've done is we've taken the original pole that was sitting here at omega naught and we multiply this by a hopefully big number. So we take the pole and we shove it out to the left. 
The thing that's particularly interesting about this version of our DC gain for the inverting configuration is that if you look at this stuff here, this A0 over K, A0 plus 1, that is the gain of the non-inverting configuration we looked at last time. So the only difference between the non-inverting configuration and the inverting configuration in terms of the DC gain is this RF over R1 plus RF factor. In contrast, the corner frequencies are the same for both configurations. Before exploring that further, let's focus on this version of the expression for a little bit. So if we were to imagine a case where a naught becomes very, very large, then eventually this plus one term becomes insignificant, the k a naughts cancel, and I'm left with rf over r1. That's interesting because that's the magnitude of the gain that you get if you just use your standard sophomore circuit theory approximations where you assume that the ground here at the positive terminal gets copied here at the negative terminal, and you can write a Kirchhoff's current law equation for this node here. So that's an informative sanity check. Okay, so let's go back and think about this version of the gain formula. Okay, so I'm going to change notation slightly and put a little I here to stand for inverting. So I can distinguish this with the formula we have here, which was for the non-inverting configuration. So if we let A naught Fi represent the gain of the inverting configuration and A naught Fn represent the gain of the non-inverting configuration, we see that the gain of the inverting configuration is reduced compared to the non-inverting configuration by this factor of RF over 1 plus RF. Interestingly, this factor here, this RF over R1 plus RF, that corresponds to a voltage divider. If we were to ask what is the contribution to the voltage at the negative terminal from the input, if we were to take the output here and ground it and cut the connection here. So that's kind of interesting. So what about the gain bandwidth product? Remember that the bandwidth in the non-inverting and the inverting cases was the same. So if I imagine multiplying both sides by the same thing, I wind up with a relationship for the gain bandwidth product in the case of the non-inverting configuration, which is the same as the gain bandwidth product of the original open loop amplifier, where we see it's greater than the gain bandwidth product for the inverting configuration according to this RF over 1 plus RF factor. So this makes a great interview question for an analog design position, which would be to compare the gain bandwidth products for the inverting and non-inverting configurations when you have a non-ideal op-amp, or I should clarify, when you have an op-amp with a non-ideal frequency response. So in comparing these configurations, if you set things up to have equal DC gains in both configurations, the inverting configuration has only a fraction of the bandwidth of the non-inverting configuration. And similarly, if you were to set both amplifiers to have the same bandwidth, then the inverting configuration would have only a fraction of the DC gain. I'm using a prime here to represent the reduced gain bandwidth product of the inverting configuration. So illustrating these concepts on a Bode plot, here I'm plotting our gain at DC for the inverting configuration, and here we're plotting the cutoff frequency. And if we're willing to have less bandwidth, we can have higher DC gain. But I'm still restricted to this particular line here that's defined by this omega x prime. So I don't have this full range that I had with the non-inverting configuration. So what if you wanted to build a circuit that just inverts the signal? So it inverts, but it otherwise has unity gain. Well, you would set RF and R1 to be the same, and then this factor here would turn into a half. So a unity gain inverting amplifier has half the bandwidth of a non-inverting amplifier. Now, to make a high gain amplifier, you want to set RF to be a lot bigger than R1. So this fraction here is going to be pretty close to 1. So for higher and higher gains, that loss of bandwidth is less severe. 
So we focused on non-ideal effects in terms of non-infinite gain over a range of frequencies. There are other effects we could talk about. For instance, we might have non-infinite input impedance, in which case we will have some current flowing through the terminals here, or we might have non-zero output impedance. But as far as designing with op amps goes, in terms of the things that you can practically take into account in the design stage, the frequency-dependent gain is by far the most important effect. Usually you don't explicitly take non-ideal input and output impedances into account in the initial design process. You either build the circuit and test it and then tweak it, or maybe you simulate the circuit and then you tweak values as a result of what you're getting from the simulation. Now, you can set up formulas for the various effects of having these non-ideal effects in terms of input and output impedances, but I personally don't find them to be very illuminating, so I won't get into those here. Before we close out, I wanted to mention an alternative approach to analyzing the circuit. I analyzed it in terms of voltage division operations within the context of using superposition. If you look in Marshall Leach's write-up, which I'll leave a link to in the description below, he analyzes this circuit by computing a Norton equivalent circuit looking out of the negative terminal. So when he computes the Norton equivalent resistance, he grounds VO and he grounds VI. So he finds a Norton equivalent resistance that's just R1 in parallel with RF. And then he computes the short circuit current looking out of the negative terminal, which is basically like putting a ground here. So then he winds up with a current flowing through RF from V0 to this ground, and a current flowing from VI through R1 to that ground. Now, I personally found the amount of algebra needed to get from that Norton equivalent circuit approach to the final answer to be more extensive than the amount of algebra I needed to do using my voltage divider approach, but your mileage may vary. In any case, I strongly recommend that you check out Marshall Leach's write-up.